Hello, everybody. I see those participant numbers starting to rise. Come on in, grab a seat, grab a drink. Don't grab a person unless you have consent. <laughs> That's not how this works. Um, but hello, everyone. Welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. Uh, welcome back to our returning audience members. Uh, happy hello to our first timers and a big thank you for those of you who uh, are watching the recording. Uh, Skeptical Inquirer Presents is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. Uh, today, if, in case you didn't know, is James A. Garfield's birthday. He was the 20th president of the United States, and he said, and I quote, uh, it is the high privilege and sacred duty of those now living to educate their successors and fit them by intelligence and virtue for the inheritance which awaits them. And that in a nutshell is, is what this lecture series is about. And many of the guests uh, that we have here were originally scheduled to speak uh, at SciCon in Las Vegas this past October. The, the pandemic had other plans, uh, but big ideas cannot be contained in conference halls. And so that's how this intellectual and informative endeavor was born. And I am delighted to be the host. Uh, my name is Leanne Lord, and I am a stand up comedian, author, and co host for Point of Inquiry, uh, the podcast for the Center for Inquiry, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. Um, as we continue to wrestle with the pandemic, please be sure to check out uh, CFI's Coronavirus Resource Center, which you can find at centerforinquiry.org slash coronavirus. Uh, if you're not already, I encourage you to subscribe to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. I had hoped to have my copy here to wave in front of you and show uh, as, a, as, a, as a live uh, promo, uh, but I think my cat has gotten a hold of it. Uh, he's very skeptical. Uh, but you can enjoy a digital subscription that gives you unlimited online reading access. With the print subscription, you get six issues a year delivered right to your door, plus you also get the bonus of the digital subscription as well. Um, that's an amazing value, you guys. And I cannot choose for you, but I would pick door number two because that's the best of both worlds. Now, if you've been with us before, uh, this part will be a little boring, uh, but the flow of the evening is very easy. I will introduce our guest. He will razzle dazzle you and then we will open it up for your questions. You will notice at the bottom of the screen, uh, there is a little box marked Q&A. It's that simple and you will type your questions there if you have any uh, in the form of a question. And if you miss any of this event tonight, it is being recorded and it will be available on skepticalinquirer.org. Uh, so our guest, you guys, this is so exciting, uh, is a private investigator uh, specializing in investigation of confidence crimes, most notably psychic fraud. He has been instrumental in the arrest and conviction of numerous psychics, helping their victims obtain justice, including financial restitution amounting to millions of dollars. He has consulted for ABC News in 2020 and well, as a specialist in psychic fraud. He is retired, you guys, that's so nice, retired from the New York City Transit Police and the Nassau County Police Department. In August 2018, he appeared as himself in an episode of The Psychic Didn't See Him Coming uh, of the CBS true crime show Pink Collar Crimes, uh, which actually portrays his investigation uh, of the crimes committed by self-proclaimed psychic and now convicted fraudster. Uh, fraudster Gina Marks. And in January, this upcoming January, if we can make it to the end of the year, year, you guys, we have something to look forward to. In January, you can catch him in an episode of the ABC series, The Con. Uh, an outspoken critic of the inconsistent prosecution of this type of crime, uh, our guest advocates for prison terms uh, for convicted, convicted psychics, uh, rather than just, you know, forced restitution for their victims. He really, he really is the perfect speaker uh, to have with us during International Fraud Awareness Week. 
I, I don't know if this is the plan that we had in advance, but it really does work out. And so here to talk with us about combating fortune telling fraud, uh, please welcome Bob Nygaard. Bob, you have thank, the con. Thank you so much, Leanne. So welcome. Thank you very much. So what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is psychic fraud. And I want to jump right into it. And I want to say that what psychic fraud is, is it's a financial crime. It's a crime that is designed to exploit vulnerable people. What happens is you have a self-proclaimed psychic who claims that they have supernatural abilities that are given to them by God or, you know, however, they have supernatural abilities and that they can use these abilities to help people solve problems that they're experiencing in their lives such as problems with love and money and health. Now, not everyone would fall victim to a psychic fraud, but when you're vulnerable, anybody could fall victim. And what happens is generally is they're financially exploiting vulnerable people under the guise of offering them assistance. And the people who are the victims of this crime, the victims are people who are experiencing problems with love and money and health their husband left them, their wife left them. They have a child that has autism. They have, um, uh, they've been diagnosed with cancer or, or an illness. Uh, they've lost their job. So people are experiencing a lot of problems and you know, the doctor's not gonna tell them, oh, I can cure that cancer if he can't. Uh, you know, a psychologist is not gonna, or a marriage counselor is not gonna say, I can bring your husband or boyfriend or girlfriend back to you if they can't. But the self-proclaimed psychic is willing to tell the person anything in order to help get the money away from that person, to help part that person from their money. So what happens is a vulnerable person who's going through a difficult time in their life will seek out a psychic during a time when they're looking for uh, some assistance with solving the problems in their life. And generally what happens is you have psychics that are getting people in a couple of different ways. They're doing it through um, uh, online, where they're getting people online, a major way to do it is storefronts. They're getting people through the storefronts. People are walking in off the street, and then uh, they're also just walking up to people in malls and stuff like that. So you have the storefront psychics, you have the uh, psychics that are walking up and accosting people on the street, and then you have the online psychics. Uh, so what happens is generally the ones that I deal with are the storefront psychics for the most part. And uh, the vulnerable person will walk into the psychic shop and they will tell all of a sudden they'll start to, the psychic will turn over the tarot cards or look in the crystal ball and they'll say, I see a darkness. I see a negativity. I see something that is blocking you from being where you should be. And then they elicit the problems that the person is experiencing and they learn what is it that's bothering this person. Then they say, you know something, this never should have happened to you. You never should have gotten cancer. Uh, your husband should have never left you. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have lost your job. There's something going on, a darkness that is blocking you. And I need to remove that in order to bring your husband back. I needed to remove that to cure the cancer. So in order to solve the problem, I'm going to remove that. But in order to do that, what I need to do is I need to have some money because I need to buy some crystals and candles, very expensive crystals and candles. And then what you need to do is buy the crystals and candles and then I will meditate over the crystals and candles. And then I will find out what the root cause of the problem is. So the self-proclaimed psychic will tell the victim that they need to do deeper research to find out what the root cause of the problem is. So what we start into is a progression of fees. The self-proclaimed psychic will charge maybe something under hundred dollars for the first reading. And then what will happen is the self-proclaimed psychic will say, oh, you know what? Now I need a few hundred dollars to buy crystals and candles. So with this, the self-proclaimed psychic will get the, the money and then they'll say, go home and say some prayers and meditate and I'll give you a call. And they start to develop a relationship with the victim. And then they'll call them up at night and say, oh, you know, we'll say some prayers together. I'm doing the work. I'm meditating over the candles. I'm, you know, lighting the candles. I'm meditating on the crystals. And then you need to come back and see me. And then when the person comes back to see the self-proclaimed psychic, the psychic says, oh, you know what? It's worse than I thought. There seems to be a curse or an evil spirit that's plaguing you. But in order to remove that, I'm going to need more money. 
So then they want to get the person to believe in this evil spirit or the curse. So they often perform a magic trick in order to get the person to believe in the evil spirit or the curse. So what they'll do is they'll tell the person, say you're 30 years old. What I need you to do is go home, go to the bank, get $30,000, and I need you to put it under your mattress. Then what I need you to do is I need you to get a carton of eggs and take out one of the eggs and put it under the mattress where you have the money because money is the root of all evil. And what we wanna do is we wanna get the evil to leave you and we're gonna tempt it with the money. And then it's, we need to trap it in something. So we'll trap it in the egg. The egg represents the soul. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna trap the evil in the egg. Then what will happen is sometimes it's a grapefruit. Sometimes it's an orange. It depends where they are. If they're in Florida, they say put a, instead of an egg, they might say put a grapefruit or an orange or something. But in any event, they're gonna do this magic trick. So what they do is they tell the person, put the money under the, the bed, put the egg under the bed. And then what they do is they say, oh, we've angered the spirits. It's gone to the money. You need to bring me the money right now. Bring me the egg right now. So the vulnerable person will gather up the money. They'll put it in a sack. They'll, they'll bring the egg and they'll give it to the self-proclaimed psychic. It'll be dark in the room and the psychic will turn them around. And then the psychic will say, oh, look. And he, the psychic will take the egg, put it in a bag and then they'll go, oh, and they'll hit it like they're trying to break it, but it won't break. They go, oh, it won't break. It won't break. Oh, this is bad. And then they'll pull the egg out and they'll hit it and it'll look like blood came out of the egg or red liquid will come out. What they did is they took an egg that was already in the bag. They took the egg that the person gave them, they switched it out and then they make it look like the egg had blood and they say, oh, look, that's the evil. That's the curse. And so they try to prove the existence of the curse through the magic trick. And the victim gets all shook up because they're thinking, well, that shouldn't have happened. I mean, you know, here I am. And, uh, you know, how did, how did that egg that I put in that bag turn out to have that, that red, you know, that blood come out of it? And they get, they get scared. And then they give them the bums rush, basically. They say, you have to leave right now because this could affect me, my family, my children. What we need to do is you need to get out of here right away. And um, I'll take the money and I'll bury the money and, and I'll get rid of it and uh, bury it somewhere. But don't worry, you can get it back. I just need to bury it. Or better yet, I'll take it to my church, to the altar. And what I'll do is I'll cleanse the money at the altar and then I'll give it back to you. So what happens is the person never gets the money back. Now, a lot of times when you're dealing with these psychic fraud cases, what happens is I'm not trying to prove when I prove a case. So we have the psychic fraud is, is defrauding a vulnerable person. We have the vulnerable person. And then you say, well, Bob, how do you prove this? Well, what happens is when you're trying to, when you get them arrested for the crime. So what I do is I interview the victim and I say, what happened from the first moment that you met the psychic? What is it that the psychic said to you? And I look at the progression of fees. Okay, they started me off with a reading for $50. Then they told me they needed crystals and candles for $800. Then they told me that I needed to do a ritual involving uh, an egg and money. And then they told me there was a curse on me. And then once they told me there was the curse on me, they told me they needed to take the money, take it to their church, take it to the altar, cleanse it, and then I would get it back. So here's the thing. A lot of police and prosecutors think, well, how is it a crime if the person is willingly giving their money to the self-proclaimed psychic? And that really irks me because police and prosecutors should know better. Willingly is not willingly. The word willingly is not willingly if undue influence is involved. And a lot of times what people fail to take into account is the undue influence being exerted over the victim. Another thing that you have to take into account is a lot of times police and prosecutors will say to me when I bring a victim in and bring a case is, well, you know, they willingly gave the money and they were paying for a service. They're not paying for a service because it's not like I'm paying you $30,000 to remove a curse. What I'm doing is I'm giving you $30,000 that you're gonna set, the psychic is saying they're gonna hold it temporarily. They're gonna cleanse the money of the evil and then they're gonna give it back to the person. So the person is not paying $30,000 for a service. They're expecting that money back. And very often when I investigate these cases, what I find is that the victims are told that don't worry, you're gonna get back 10 times what you're giving me. There's a promise that money's gonna be returned, okay? And what I'm looking to do is not prove whether or not someone has psychic ability. I don't happen to believe in psychic ability, but going into court, that could be a difficult thing to prove, but what happens, you know, whether someone has psychic ability or not. But what I'm looking to prove is the theft. 
okay? Theft by false pretenses, theft by false pretenses, theft by false promises, theft by trickery. Basically, what I'm trying to prove is one person, one individual lying to another individual in order to get that person to part with their money. It's very simple. I don't need the, the, the psychic aspect of it. That's a subterfuge. And there was a case down in South Florida, a big, huge case involving uh, Rose Marks and, and some of her family members. And uh, she ended up getting convicted. But the feds called me up. The United States District Attorney's Office, Southern District of Florida, called me up. And they said, hey, Bob, can you come in? We'd like to pick your brain. We see that you've been successful with some of these cases. And we're kind of floundering a little bit uh, in, in regard to the prosecution strategy. You know, and I went in and I met with them. There was a room of, of people and the prosecutor's agents and whatnot. And they said to me, Bob, how are we ever going to prove whether this woman is psychic or not? And I said, whoa, whoa, time out. You know, you, you're pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. All right. You're off in the wrong direction. That's not what we're trying to do in these cases. What we're trying to do is prove the theft. I said, let me give you an example. I said, let's say Bob is a psychic. Let's, for argument's sake, let's say psychic ability does exist and Bob is a psychic. And let's say Bob says to Joe, hey, Joe, you know what? You're going to be in a terrible car accident next week because your car is possessed by evil spirits. So what I need to do is, Joe, you need to give Bob me your car and I need to take it and take it to my church and cleanse it. And once I'm done cleansing it of the evil spirits, you won't be in an accident anymore and you won't die. And I'll give you your car back next Friday. So Joe says, well, you know what? I don't know if Bob is really psychic or not, but I don't want to be in an accident. I don't want to die. So you know what? I'll take a chance. So Joe gives Bob the car. Bob takes the car. Next Friday comes. Joe's standing there waiting for Bob to bring his car back. Bob's nowhere to be found. The car's nowhere to be found. Did Bob steal Joe's car is what I said to them. And I said, well, yeah, Bob. I mean, of course, you know, Bob stole Joe's car. I said, does it matter whether Bob's psychic or not? And they looked at me and they said, wow, you know something? It wouldn't even matter whether you were psychic or not. And I said, welcome to the game. It has nothing to do with someone being psychic. It's the interaction that occurs between the victim and the suspect and what is said. Now, there's a lot of other ways that you can prove these crimes and by looking into the provable lies. So what happens is a self-proclaimed psychic will tell a person, uh, I need to do the work for you to remove the evil spirit or the curse or the darkness or the blockage and you need to give me this money. And they might say, I need to travel to Canada to do some work up at uh, your grandfather's grave in Canada because the problem originates there. Well, when I do an investigation and I check with the State Department or ICE and I find out that the person never even left the country, the self-proclaimed psychic never went to Canada, well, then we have the provable lie, okay? If uh, the, the person is saying they're going to give the money back and they're texting them and they're saying in the text messages, don't worry, uh, I'm going to give you the 30000 back by, you know, March 16th and they don't give the money back, then you have a provable lie, okay? You have a false promise. Uh, I had a case where I had a guy, young guy, and the psychic said that uh, the psychic needed gift cards and the gift cards were needed so that the psychic could um, do some work. And uh, being that the guy didn't have cash, what the psychic did is that the psychic will wipe the person out of all their cash. And then when they have no more liquid assets, they'll say, go to the store and get a credit card, open up credit cards at Macy's and Bloomingdale's and whatnot. So they start tapping into the victim's credit. And they'll say, what I need you to do is open up the credit card. And then right away, you can get gift cards on that credit card, $5,000 worth of gift cards. So what they'll do is say, give me a couple of gift cards. And then I will use the gift cards to buy the crystals and candles to do the work. Well, in this particular case, when I traced the gift cards, it turned out that the gift cards were used for a kid's birthday party at like Chuck E. Cheese. They were not used to buy crystals and candles. Once again, here you go. You got provable lies. So, you know, these cases are not hard to prove. And what happens is very often when I'll go into a police department or I'll try to report it and talk to a prosecutor, they'll say, oh, these cases are so difficult to prove. I mean, we'll never be able to prove this. That's not true. It's because of their inexperience. I've caused over 50 self-proclaimed psychics to be uh, arrested and or convicted. And I've never lost a case. And I've recovered millions of dollars for people. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, a falsity 
that these cases can't be prosecuted successfully. If you go on and you Google and go online and put psychic acquitted, you'll be hard pressed to find a case. If you put psychic arrested, psychic convicted, you'll find plenty of cases. So that does irk me a bit that uh, very often police and prosecutors um, you know, don't wanna do these cases because they think they're hard to prove when in fact they're not. Uh, it just takes determination whereby you have to really uh, do your homework and really interview the victim very thoroughly and gather all the financial records and then really uh, have good interview skills as to find out what was the interactions that occurred, why was the money given and was it given under false pretenses. Now, the victims are very maligned and that bothers me too because very often these victims are looked down upon by society, by police, by prosecutors, when anybody that's going through a crisis in their life uh, you know, isn't operating at the same mental capacity that they normally are when they're not undergoing a crisis. Uh, you know, I know just from the police department, when I used to be on a police department, we went to the shooting range and we went to the shooting range. Uh, we went sometimes in the day and we practiced and we shot at the target. Sometimes we went at night. And then I remember one time we went at night and they shot off firecrackers while we were shooting and everybody's score went down. So the thing is when people are under stress, they don't operate at the same optimal efficiency that they normally do. Someone loses their job, they're not gonna, sometimes they suspend their critical thinking. Uh, someone's husband leaves them, wife leaves them, someone's boyfriend leaves them, girlfriend leaves them. Someone finds out that their spouse is cheating on them. Uh, you know, someone's child is sick, someone lost their job. You know, these are all major crises that are going on in someone's life that causes them to sometimes suspend their critical thinking. The self-proclaimed psychics are there and they're just all waiting, just waiting to come in. And what they do is they have a very good product. They have false hope. So they sell the person, basically are selling them false hope that, and they're saying that they can cure the illness. They can take care of whatever that problem is. And often they're very personable. They will say to the person, oh, don't worry, you know, uh, you know, I can help you. You're like the sister that I never had. You're like the mother that I never had. You're like the daughter that I never had. So the self-proclaimed psychic will be very personal. They'll send them birthday cards. They'll send them Christmas cards. They'll invite them to come over and meet their family. They'll introduce them to their children. And so, you know, these people, they, they get very, uh, uh, you know, taken in by these professional con artists. And, and what I often say is don't blame the victim, credit the con, the skill that these professional con artists have. So it's, it's very important not to look down on the victims, not to mock the victims. Very often the victims are very intelligent people. Uh, people that, I have clients that are doctors, lawyers, scientists, college professors, uh, you know, people from all walks of life, all different ages, all different ethnicities, all different you know, educational backgrounds, but very often the people are very intelligent. And you would, at first blush, you would think, how could an intelligent person fall for something like this? But what you have to have is empathy and you have to realize that, like I said, we're not all operating at optimum efficiency. You know, Sometimes we suspend our critical thinking in life when we're going through a difficult time. And these financial crimes, they need to be taken more seriously by police and prosecutors because they've, you know, they, they've, they have long lasting impacts on the victim's lives. Now, when I was a young cop, I, I wanted to make murder arrest, robbery arrest, rape arrest. Oh, I wanted to, to be a narcotics and make drug arrest. You know, I wanted to do all the, 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 uh, the, the things that young guys, young cops at the time back in the 80s, you know, we, we wanted to do all of these type things, be in a narcotics unit, you know, be in a robbery squad. Uh, be in the homicide unit, you know, and, and I did make arrests for things like that, uh, you know, made murder arrests and rape arrests and robbery arrests, but uh, it wasn't until I actually got further on in my career that I saw how important these financial crimes are because they can really, uh, you know, ruin somebody's life. When someone loses their life savings, it's very hard to recover from that often, especially with the elderly when uh, people are up in age and maybe they're retired and that's their, that's their whole retirement savings. You know, these self-proclaimed psychics prey upon people and they emotionally abuse them and financially devastate them. Um, I had a case where a woman called me one time and she said to me, hey, Bob, uh, you know, I'm out $90,000 and it's money that my husband and I, you know, we saved up our whole lives to send our daughter to, to uh, college. And I said, oh, okay, you know, and uh, she said, you know, she was from, from Queens, New York. 
And she said, you know, we don't, we don't have much, my husband and I, and, and we really struggle to get this money and, and save it our whole lives to be able to send our daughter to college. And I said, well, you know, I, you know, I've been very successful. Let me see what I can do. I'll help you build a case. And she says, you don't understand, Bob. You just don't understand. And, and I, she sounded like her voice was quivering. And I said, no, it, you know, I do. I mean, I, I've been doing this for a number of years. I do understand. She says, Bob, no, you really don't understand. And I said, well, you know, enlighten me. Like, you know, what am I not getting here? She says, Bob, I'm on my lunch break right now. She says, and as I'm talking, I'm standing on the eighth floor on the ledge. She goes, and I think I should just take that one step and end it all. And, uh, and I talked her off the ledge. And, um, you know, the reason that I bring this up is because, you know, often when people call me, these victims, uh, sometimes they're suicidal because they've lost everything. She said to me, Bob, how, I don't know how I'm ever gonna go home and face my husband and my daughter and tell them that my, she can't go to college anymore, that I gave all of this away in three months that we worked our whole life for. And uh, I've had clients that were elderly and gave away their life savings and, and they couldn't pay the rent on the place that they were living. Um, and so it's a devastating crime when the self-proclaimed psychics are financially bilking people you know, and, and the psychic industry takes in billions of dollars and that's with a B. And, uh, and yet law enforcement does not treat financial crimes with the seriousness that they deserve. They often get a slap on the wrist when they go to court. Uh, you know, there's a lot of impediments to prosecution in, in that police often mock the victims or laugh. I just got an email the other day and, and a victim said to me, hey, Bob, I just went and I reported to the police and they made me feel stupider than I feel already. And I said, listen, the first thing you need to do is you need to be kind to yourself, okay? You need to give yourself a break because anybody can fall for this when going through a difficult time in their life. And don't beat yourself up over this. We'll, we'll, we'll work together and we'll you know, work on helping you obtain the justice that you deserve. But it really bothers me when someone like that goes into a police station and they have met with laughter, misreporting, and ignorance. And uh, you know, I have cases where the, the detective might help me, and then the detective is a good guy, and he helps me, and then he goes to see the prosecutor, and the prosecutor says, a psychic, are you kidding me? Why did this person willingly gave their money to a psychic? And they laugh, and then they, they decline to prosecute the case because they've never done it before. They've done cases you know, for, um, for um, you know, DWI, they've done robberies, they've done you know, assault cases, but maybe they've been a prosecutor for 10 years and they've never, or 15 years or even 20 years, and they've never done a, uh, a psychic case. So, um, you know, this is a very devastating uh, a crime and uh, the victims are often very maligned and it's not a hard crime to prove if you put in the work and you show some due diligence. And, you know, a lot of times the victims are embarrassed and they're ashamed and uh, I had a guy that was a college professor that called me up and he said to me, hey, Bob, uh, you know, I want to talk to you. I'm a college professor. I'm out three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And I said to him, OK, well, you know, I'll help you out. I'll build a case. We'll see if we we'll get the money back. He says, Bob, are you even listening to me? I said, yeah, no, I'm listening to you. I, I want to build a case for you. He says, Bob, you, you obviously you, you're not a very good listener. And I said, well, what am I missing? You know, I don't I don't understand. And he says to me, Bob, I told you I'm a college professor. He says, I could never bring a case. He goes, if I ever had to go to court and go to trial, he goes, you know, if everybody found out my name, he goes, I, I could never go back on that campus again. He goes, I could never talk in front of the students again. He goes, I'd be the laughing stock of, of, of the campus or in front of the students and, and the faculty. He goes, I'm just calling you to talk to you. This man let $350,000 go and he had a very good case because he was too embarrassed or ashamed. And you know, so that plays right into the hands of these self-proclaimed psychics because very often they you know, know that people are gonna to be too embarrassed or ashamed to come forward. For every one person that does, I would say there's probably 50 that don't come forward. And then if they do come forward, they're met with laughter, misreporting and ignorance. They're going in and trying to report it at a police station and being turned away and laughed at. If they do get the detective to help them, then the, the detective has to deal with a prosecutor who might laugh at them. So all the stars have to align, basically. You know, everything has to line up where you have 
uh, the person goes into the police station, the person, you know, the police officer takes their report seriously. And then what happens is the police officer talks to the detective, the detective talks to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor realizes that it's something that needs to be prosecuted. Now, you know, that's a lot of things that have to align. So what I do is I use my training and experience to help people navigate their way to a criminal justice system that's largely unsympathetic towards their plight. So when I go in, I take the victim and say, listen, you wanna know something? When this victim came into this police station, you turned them away. But now they're with me and I was a cop and I did your job and I know a report's supposed to be taken. So now it's time to take a report and I demand justice on behalf of these victims. And I tell you, you know, it's very rewarding because um, you know, these financial crimes do devastate people and by helping the people uh, I can help the people get the money back a lot of times. And then that's life changing. Uh, a woman called me, a story that comes to mind is a woman called me one day and I had helped her out in California and she had, was out over a half a million dollars. Uh, the self-proclaimed psychic had built her out of a, over a half a million dollars. And um, the case involved, the woman uh, was going through an acrimonious divorce with a, a domineering uh, type husband. And she had a daughter and it was her only child. And the daughter was uh, maybe 10, 12 years old. And um, what happened was the uh, self-proclaimed psychic uh, preyed upon the fact that the husband was trying to gain custody of the child and the mother was desperate not to lose her only child to the husband, the custody in, in you know, this, the divorce case. So two days before she was supposed to go to uh, court and see who was gonna get custody of the child, um, the self-proclaimed, so he reached out to a self-proclaimed psychic and the self-proclaimed psychic said she could help her gain custody of the child. So what do you have here? You have a, a mother who's desperate, who doesn't want to lose the custody of her only child. And so she, she, no one's going to be able to guarantee that. So she goes online, she finds a psychic, the psychic guarantees it. She's trying to get any edge she can. Of course, the psychic wants money, you know, in order to do this, she has to say prayers, she has to meditate, she has to do all kinds of hocus pocus and that she's gonna guarantee this. Well, what happened is the woman went to court and something happened where the, the woman ended up, the case got postponed and the, the woman ended up um, uh, not losing custody of the child. And then there were further hearings and that just meant that the psychic had her on a hook. See, the reason you did that happen today and you didn't lose the child today was because of the fact of the work that I did for you. And then this went on and the, and the woman started to trust in the psychic and the case went on for like 12 years. A lot of times these cases are long-term offenses where the self-proclaimed psychic will gain the trust of the victim and then start to slowly build the victim out of money by developing a relationship with the victim. They're very personable. They'll call them every day. When I do a case, I'll see text messages, 10, 15, 20 text messages a day that develop, uh, phone calls, text messages. They'll travel and then go out together places. And uh, this is a very intricate relationship between the self-proclaimed psychic, the con artist and the victim. And uh, this woman ended up giving over half a million dollars to the psychic over a period of time. And, uh, but the reason I say it's very rewarding is I was able to get the self-proclaimed psychic arrested out in California. The psychic pled guilty. She pled guilty to a felony and she agreed to pay back all the money. Now, one day I'm, I'm, I'm driving in my car and I get a phone call and it's this woman, this is years later now. And she says to me, Hey, Bob, she says, uh, it's me and my daughter, you know where we are right now. Uh, we figured we'd give you a call. And I said, no, I have no idea. Where are you guys? And she says, uh, well, right now, she says, we're on our way to college. She says, my daughter's going to be entering medical school. She says, and had it not been for you, we were just talking, had it not been for you and had you not helped the, us get that money back, I would never have the money to send my daughter to college. So, you know, it's, it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding when you can help people like that and change people's lives. Um, and these, like I said, these financial crimes, very often uh, judges will just give the people a slap on the wrist. The people will steal all kinds of money. And then the judge will just give them a slap on the wrist and say, oh, it's a financial crime. Uh, the sentences are not very much. So a lot of times these self-proclaimed psychics, they feel that, well, you know what? Uh, it's worth the cost of doing business. You know, First of all, the victim's probably gonna be too embarrassed or ashamed to come forward. If the victim does come forward, 
well, maybe the police will take a report. If the police do take a report, well, is the detective really going to take it seriously? At that point, a lot of times the detective will reach out to the self-proclaimed psychic. The self-proclaimed psychic will lawyer up and they'll have the lawyer call the detective and say, hey, what if we pay some money back? Can't we work something out? A lot of times they'll be able to pay money back in lieu of an arrest and squash the whole thing before it even goes any further. They just look at that as the cost of doing business, these off the table restitution deals or mutual agreements not to disparage or settlement agreements. So many times they'll never even end up in court. And then if you do get a case where they are arrested and then it goes to court, it goes to court, not a prosecutor has the case. A lot of times they can work out a plea deal whereby they don't have to do much jail time if they agree to pay the money back. Now let's take a look at this. What money are they paying back? All they're paying back is the victim with their own money. I mean, so this is a very lucrative crime. And the only way that this crime is ever going to stop is if police and prosecutors start to take it more seriously. And, and if the criminal justice system, you know, the police and prosecutors within the justice system start to hand down harsher sentences so that, you know, to, to act as a deterrent so that they won't do this. Um, you know, so, so this is a big problem, uh, you know, that exists. Um, you know, one of the things is that, you know, these self-proclaimed psychics are very, very uh, good at what they do. They're professional con artists. And what I say to people is, you know, don't be embarrassed and don't be ashamed to come forward uh, against a professional con artist. But that's easier said than done. Um, you know, a lot of times it, it is a big struggle for people. And, and then you have the cases of, uh, you know, certain states like New York, uh, fortune telling is a crime in and of itself. So fortune telling, you're not allowed to claim to possess, um, you know, supernatural abilities and claim to be able to influence or affect evil spirits or curses uh, or give personal advice uh, using your uh, special self-proclaimed ability. Uh, so it's a crime in and of itself. It's a misdemeanor. Uh, it doesn't carry a very hefty sentence. What you really want to do is get the person on the grand larceny, which is a more serious offense, which carries, you know, a five-year sentence or more. So, uh, you know, that's what you're looking to do. Oklahoma has a, a fortune-telling statute. Pennsylvania has a fortune-telling statute. But most places in the country do not have fortune-telling statutes. So a lot of times people say, well, Bob, if they don't have fortune-telling statutes, how are you going to get them arrested? It comes down to theft. Once again, we're getting back to theft. You know, what you're looking at is two people dealing with each other, one person lying to the other person in order to con them out of their money. That's what this is all about. And, you know, how do you build the case? You know, you got to look at the text messages. You got to look at the uh, financial records, the bank uh, records, you know, PayPal, Venmo. How was the money being sent? Maybe wire transfers. A lot of times I have uh, cases where people are overseas. I'm getting calls from people from Ireland, Norway, uh, uh, the Middle East, uh, Australia, New Zealand. People are emailing me or calling me on WhatsApp. Or they're saying, hey, Bob, I was ripped off by a psychic in the United States. Can you help me build a case? I start to I take the case on. Now I'm looking at records of wire transfers that occurred from overseas to the United States. And a lot of times people think, well, you know, so, so Bob, if you build a case, uh, how are you going to ever get the money back? Well, a lot of times these self-proclaimed psychics, they have lots of money. A lot of times they're part of criminal enterprises. Okay. What happens is they're part of family-based organized crime groups, whereby the husband will go out and do breaking and entering. He'll go out and do uh, home improvement scams of the elderly. The, the woman will do the fortune telling. Another one that might be an attractive young woman might do sweetheart swindles of the elderly, where they go up to an old man in, in, a, in a, um, a supermarket and say, oh, you know, my husband died not long ago. You know, how are you getting along? You look lonely. And then the old man, you know, how's your wife? Oh, my wife died six years ago. Oh, my husband died too. Wouldn't it be nice if we exchanged phone numbers and got together? And then they exchange phone numbers. And then within a week, she's over his house and she's getting him to change his will. She's getting him to buy a Corvette. You know, I mean, next thing you know, the house is in her name. Uh, so you have certain family members that are doing you know, this is family-based organized crime. You have women doing the fortune telling. You have other women doing the sweetheart swindles. You have other guys that are doing the, uh, the home improvement scams. You, they're out doing body work. They're going out in parking lots and saying, hey, um, 
you know, I can fix your car. I used to work at Lexus. I see there's a dent in your car here. I, can, I have the materials and I can fix that dent for a lot cheaper than it will cost you. Uh, and then next thing you know, they're taking the old person to the ATM machine and they're getting them $2,000, $3,000 for a job that they took 30, 30 minutes to do. And it's not even a good job. Throw a little Bondo on there or paint on there. So, uh, and you have all of these different crimes that are being committed by members of the family and they're bringing in money. So now when one of them gets in trouble, say the self-proclaimed psychic gets in trouble, she doesn't want to go to jail because if she goes to jail, that's, that's going to cost her money. That's going to cost the family money because she could be earning a lot of money out on the street doing the, the psychic stuff, but she can't do that from behind bars. So it's worth them, for it for them to pay the money back and work out a restitution deal and minimize the jail time so that they can go back to doing what they were doing once they get off probation. It's just the cost of doing business for these people. So, you know, I had a case in, in Manhattan one time and I wanted to take it to the U.S. Attorney's Office in, in uh, New York. And uh, it was brought up by the agent to the, uh, the supervisor there. Well, I have a case and this guy, Bob Nygaard has the case and he's saying that it's organized crime. And the supervisor said something about, well, what organized crime is it? Is it the mafia? You know, is it the, uh, the, you know, the Russian mafia? Is it the Italians? And basically with these storefront psychics, and I don't want to disparage any ethnic group, but it's just a fact of life that of the cases that I, have investigated the majority of the storefront psychics who I have helped to cause to be arrested were from the American Romani community. Now, of course, there's good and bad in all communities. It's like, I would never say that all Italian people are in the mafia because it would be ludicrous. The same thing, there's a lot of good American Romani people. It's just that of the storefront psychics, a lot of them happen to be American Romani. And there are there is a criminal element within that community just like the mafia is in the, uh, you know, in Italians is the mafia. So, you know, all groups have their good and bad, but, um, but what happens is it's not recognized as organized crime. It's not recognized as a criminal group. So they fly under the radar and very often that occurs is because they're nonviolent. When you're dealing with these financial crimes, these crimes are nonviolent crimes. So, um, you know, a lot of times uh, groups that are committing crimes that are nonviolent can get away with things that, uh, you know, that the, the violent criminal groups are, are cracked down on and the other ones, the, the nonviolent ones are flying under the radar. And once again, like I said, I, you know, I don't want to disparage anybody, but, uh, you know, there are certain facts as to uh, certain groups of people that, you know, do commit certain crimes and uh, of the crimes that I have investigated, that's what I have found. Um, you know, it, it's a very serious matter. And, uh, you know, I could go on and on for a long time uh, about, you know, these various uh, crimes, but I think it's time maybe we open up some questions. Uh, I've been running off uh, with all these stories for long enough now, and I think maybe some people might have some questions as to what I'm talking about. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bob. And yes, they do. Yes, people okay. do have questions, but thank you so much uh, for, for everything you shared, both the information and the the touching stories because I think these these crimes are made um, more accessible, more understandable when you introduce that human element of, yes. of what can happen. I mean, when you talked about the whole family based, you know, uh, crime organization, I'm like that that's not the family values uh, I think we all had in mind. Um, that sweetheart deal that you talked about really scared me. Right. Um, you know, because I, I mean, I think of my old folks, you know, when in the old folks I see in the grocery store and it's very easy to befriend them and yeah. talk to them. Because we're all going to be me. old one day, you know, we're all going to be old one day, hopefully. And oh, man, I'm, tr I'm trying to drink just enough bourbon to preserve myself. I, yeah. I don't think it's <laughs> working. Um, you, you you talked about so much, you know, I, and I don't know I, what what I've learned tonight is that a psychic is not in the budget for me because they're they're really milking people. And I wanna talk to you maybe later about theft by false promise because I think I might have a case against Apple because my phone is not the absolute best phone <laughs> they <laughs> promised me it would be. But let's get to some of these questions uh, sure. that we have. Um, and there's there's a, quite a few good ones in here. Um, uh, and and you j uh, did address one of them. You know, there have been a couple questions in here about is this, you know, can does this speak to the intelligence of the person who's right. falling? 
Yeah. Scam. And, and, I, and I would say absolutely not, you know. Um, I, and I talked about that, you know, that we sometimes suspend our critical thinking when we're going through a crisis. And I don't think that's something that should be looked down upon. It's just a, a human, uh, you know, fact of life that that does happen. I don't think anybody would deny that when they're under stress, they are not acting optimally or thinking optimally a lot of times. And we're not robots, you know, we're people, we're not robots. Or as I, I, I'd like to think I'm Vulcan at times, but no, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, do some of these psychics and fortune tellers actually believe that they're psychic or are they, are they buy, drink their own Kool-Aid or are they just really running a scam? Uh, well, the ones that I've dealt with, uh, I believe that they, uh, for the most part, you know, don't believe that they have the ability. And that's borne out by, I know there's a case, a couple of cases where people have gone to parole hearing self-proclaimed psychics. There was an article in the New York Times where they were looking to get out and they were up at their parole hearing and they said to them, do you know that, you know, you don't have the ability, it was all a lie. And they're like, absolutely, it was all a lie. You know, I never had the ability. Or sometimes when they give their allocution, uh, when they have a plea deal and they're asked, do you have the ability you know, or was it all a lie? I mean, you admit that it was a lie. And they say, yeah, I admit it was a lie for when I get the plea deal. So in those circumstances, obviously, the person is admitting that they knew they didn't have the ability. I have a, a question here from, from Dwayne uh, Ruth. And I think this is a good one. Essentially, the, the question is, is, is there a statute of limitations here? You know, what can be done if like four or five years ago, a psychic like this defrauded their friend out of hundreds of thousands of dollars, like their 401k, you know, using this same scam, you know, is, is there anything you can do, even though it was four or five years ago? Depends upon the state. Uh, mm. different states have different statute of limitations, like New York on a grand larceny has a five year. Uh, Rhode Island, I believe, has a 10 year. Flo uh, Florida has a five year. Uh, California has four years or from the date of discovery, from the last time you gave money or mm. from when the date the person discovered it or reasonably should have discovered it. So what you have to do is look at each state and look at what their statute of limitations is and then see how long you have after the crime occurred in order to bring the charges. And that means not just reporting it to the police, but you need to get them charges filed within that amount of time. Mm. And, and that actually reminds me, you know, I, I knew about New York. I did not know about, uh, you know, Oklahoma and, and, and uh, Pennsylvania. How do you know why New York even has this on the books, even though it's not always enforced? Well, the legislature at the time, by, you know, that they enacted the, the statute believed that they were protecting a vulnerable population who was being built of uh, millions of dollars a year. And they felt that it was an important statute. And they put in there that it's for entertainment purposes, that it's okay to do it for entertainment purposes only in conjunction with an exhibition or a show. But you can't, you know, you can't per se just say I have psychic ability unless it's like at a state fair and you've got a permit and you're admitting it's for entertainment purposes only. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm looking for the question here and I don't see it, um, but, the, but just, just so to I'm back gonna paraphrase. Up, yeah, just to I'm back sorry. up, but basically the answer to that question with the legislatures that make the law, they felt it was important to protect society at that point from, you know, people being built. You know? Are you seeing any um, uptick in uh, this type of crime uh, during the pandemic, you know, because mm -hmm. of COVID? That's an excellent question. My phone is ringing off the hook. My email <laughs> wow. is going crazy. Uh, they are, this, I've seen articles online which bear that out because um, you know they're saying that the psychic business is raking it in. These, these people are raking it in, and it's up like you know 250 percent or whatever it is. Uh, you know, it's up large amounts, and I, and that bears out in the calls that I'm getting and the emails because people are fearful. They're fearful they're going to get COVID. They're fearful that you know that if they got it, what's the long term effects of it? They're fearful someone in their family is going to die. They're losing their job. Their business is going out of business. They can't keep their business open. So. During fearful times, people, you know, often turn to psychics during when they're when they're scared. That's when the psychics do the best. And it's interesting because one of the things I found was that uh, when I was researching uh, the issue of the COVID and the increase in the, the way that people are calling me, I saw that the spiritualist movement actually started back when the Spanish flu was going on because millions of people were dying. And that's when the seances and the spiritualist movement came about and had a big surge 
because of the fact people wanted to speak with their dead, lost, you know, loved ones um, that were dying in the Spanish flu. So that's when all of that stuff came about. So, you know, that bears that out too, that uh, during uh, times of crisis, uh, you know, these uh, charlatans come out of the woodwork. Mm, and now exactly. another thing I wanted to say is very lucrative because, you know, like say the average storefront in New York City, the average self-proclaimed psychic that you see, um, you know, based on if I extrapolate, you know, how much my clients gave over what period of time, and I talk to other people that do it, um, you know, they make about $350,000 a year. You know, and that's if they're no good. I mean, this is, they're breaking in huge amounts of money and they don't need, they, you know, they do the $5, $10, $20 readings on a Saturday night, but they're looking for the big fish. They're looking, they get one client that gives them a couple hundred. That That's their, their well, you know, they get people to give them millions of dollars. You know, the case in South Florida was, was like a, one woman had given approximately $17 million. She was a best selling author and her son had died. Her eight year old boy had died. And it was a tragic event. And uh, the self-proclaimed psychic built her for something around 17 million, I believe, um, over the course of many years, you know, millions of dollars over the course of many years. Wow. So, you know, these, these crimes are not just, you know, $100. We're talking millions of dollars. Right. I, I, I find myself trying to embrace the, 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 uh, the bright side of my of my life and not go into business for myself <laughs> buy myself a little crystal ball at walmart and set up shop that would not be right i would never do that right. um well, so, now someone made a, an interesting correlation here they said that what you're describing is pretty close to what uh, then thank you tony kendrick is pretty close to what a tv preacher does um no no i i, I disagree you know a lot okay. of times what bothers me is the self-proclaimed psychics will use a lot of religious terminology like i'm doing god's work you know uh i'm going to the altar with your money i'm going to cleanse it and give it back to you you know but when you're at church and you put money into the collection plate the pre the pastor or the priest doesn't say don't worry, I'm going to take it up to the altar. I'm going to cleanse it. And then I'm going to give you the money you put into the collection plate back next Friday. There's a big difference. You know, they're not saying, give me $30,000. You'll have it back next Friday or in a month from now. You know, that's the difference. Um, and if you look at the, the promises that are being made and the representations that are being made, um, you know, you can easily pick out the solid provable lies Um you know, when the self-proclaimed psychic is, is making the lies to the people, as opposed to someone giving money. Now, if someone was, say you weren't in New York or say you weren't in Oklahoma, say you weren't in Pennsylvania, say you were in Florida or California and the self-proclaimed psychic said, give me $30,000 to remove a curse. And you gave 30,000 to remove a curse. Now, who's to say whether they can move, move a curse or not, you know, whether they can light candles and pray and cause a curse to be removed. So what happens is, is that it would be def very difficult to prove that a crime was committed there, you know, because you can't, unless you can show the provable lies. So that's really the difference, you know, just giving money to someone because they claim they can do something unless you can actually prove that they can't do it or they knew they couldn't do it or intended not to do it. That's the whole thing. So like, Say you, you paid someone to put kitchen cabinets in. This all comes down to intent, all right? If, if you paid someone $10,000 to put in some kitchen cabinets and they came and then they measured and then they didn't come back and then they claimed that they had a problem and that's why they couldn't come back and you, you get into an argument, you might not be able to get them for theft because they've done some of, some of the work towards doing it. They took the money, maybe they got sick, whatever. You know, like why are they not putting in the kitchen cabinets? But if you give someone 10,000 to do kitchen cabinets and then they take a trip to the Bahamas with the money and that's what their intention was the whole time. Never, and you can show they never intended on putting in the cabinets. They intended on taking a trip to the Bahamas with the money. That's different. Bernard Madoff, he didn't invest the money. He took the money, but he never put it into the stocks that he said. So, you know, someone just saying, I'm a self-proclaimed psychic, give me money. That's not in and of itself, depending on where you are in the country, depending on the laws of that state. Could be a crime, New York, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, depends where you are. So, but, you know, a preacher saying to people, uh, you know, I believe in God and put money in the collection plate, that doesn't rise to that level. Mm. So this really does turn on uh, them saying, I'm, I'm going to take this money in, but I'm going to give it back to you. But does that hold up over time where people have given so much money? 
Um, and that's Rob Palmer's question. He's asked a ton of questions. Mm -hmm. I didn't get, get a chance yeah. to acknowledge him. But, you know, were, the, were these victims told what they, they were going to get all that money back? So, I mean, is there... Yeah, I, I guess it's case by case. It's case by case. And you have to really look at what was said. What was the interactions? What were the promises that were made over what period of time? And, and then you add other factors into it, like the self-proclaimed psychic would say, you know, don't worry, I'm going to take your money. I have an office at St. Patrick's Cathedral and I'm going to take the money and put it for safekeeping in my office at St. Patrick's uh, or St. John of the Vines Church. And they have no affiliation with that church. They don't have an office out there. So, you know, you have to look at the totality of the facts and circumstances surrounding the crime. Maybe one thing in and of itself might not be enough to put you over to have probable cause to believe that a crime was committed and be able to successfully prosecute it. But when you look at the totality of the facts and circumstances and you start to add up the lies that are told, that's what you build. That's how you build a case. Um, Mark, Mark Seiden has asked a couple of good questions. Uh, one, and I, and, and I'm not sure if you've kind of answered this, that's why I'm going back to it. Have, you know, in the wake of this pandemic, have some of these things, these scams moved online or, 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 or is, is that something that they're, they're taking advantage of in addition to the storefront? Yeah. Well, right? sometimes what I see from the storefront, they'll, they'll go online on a website and then they'll bring the person in that way. And then they'll say, oh, listen, you know, it's costing you a certain amount per minute. And I don't want to see you have to pay that amount of money. So I'll tell you what, I'll give you my personal number, even though I'm not supposed to do that. That's against what the, the site's rules, but I'll do it anyway. And then they get the person and now they've got them offline and then they start to bilk them that way. But they use the site to get the person in the first place, you know, and those sites are not illegal per se. If you look at the at their big legal disclaimers, they're saying it's for entertainment purposes only. And they have, you know, lawyers that are writing up these long agreements as to what you're doing when you're going on there and you're saying you realize it's for entertainment. So it would be very hard to, to prosecute, you know, someone on one of these online psychics in that manner. Mm. Um. And a, a couple of people have asked this question, and I want to know the answer to this too. You, sir, uh, you, not only do you have a distinctive look, but you, you're you're in this field. Like the field is you, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so you you're you're somewhat recognizable. Don't psychics talk to each other? Why would any of them talk to you? Uh, <laughs> Don't I, they see you coming ever? I'm known from coast to coast. Like okay, you know me. You know, so it's very hard for me to go in and uh, to uh, get a reading and go undercover because one of the ways that sometimes we get evidence on a case is to go in undercover with a recording device and record the lies, you know, get the psychic doing the, 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 the lies uh, and uh, sit down with the psychic and use, uh, you know, various different uh, recording devices and video devices. And uh, so I've done that on occasion, but I've worn disguises. <laughs> so I dress up in disguises so that they don't recognize me. Yeah. Or, wow. or I help, you know, other people help me out. Yeah. yeah. But no, undercover work is one of the ways that you help, uh, you know, that you can uh, uncover these crimes and help prove them. Nice. Nice. So many questions here, and I wish I could get to all of them because um, we're getting close to the hour. But one of the first questions that came in um, is is about that this this actually is serious work um there's a group called cf iig if i'm reading that correctly i'm a little too vain to put on my glasses right now okay. uh, and and the the biggest uh, problem that they see is actually getting the word out the public's lack of awareness in in what they do and what you're doing you're doing trying to expose this what can be done yeah, I mean, what we're doing right now, you know, uh, the skeptical community has embraced me, unbelievable. You know, I've gone to Dragon Con and I, I've been on um, on a skepticality podcast uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, uh, the, the uh, Wikipedia, Rob Palmer and Su Susan Gerbic, they, you know, helped me out and, and their whole project. They wrote a they, they wrote a they, they they did a great job on your wiki page. They did yeah, a great job I mean, for me tonight. <laughs> That's how I got your podcast. Yeah, that Barry and you know uh, inviting me to the to give the lecture, um, you know uh, Derek and, and his wife uh, April, you know from uh, skepticality and uh, all of these people in the skeptical community have done, have embraced me and have helped me get my message out and have helped me spread the word. And that is the only way that we're gonna combat this problem is by the skeptical community 
uh, banding together and helping, you know, with the help people understand the uh, ins and outs and the nature of the problem and how serious it is. Um, and that goes even towards police and prosecutors who, you know, at the end of the day, they're people too, and they have biases and they need to, and they might not come across this on a daily basis. So, you know, they need to see stuff like this in order so that when uh, a case comes across their desk or someone walks into a station house, they give it the proper, uh, the victim respect that they deserve. You know, I, I went up to uh, Canada and I gave a lecture to the Toronto police services up there, they invited me and I, and I spoke in front of 450 law enforcement officers from all over Canada, Royal Canadian Mounties and Toronto Police Department. And uh, you know, I was telling some of these same stories and uh, some of them came up to me afterwards and said, wow, Bob, you know, I didn't realize like the woman that was on the ledge and you know, was gonna kill herself and you know, uh, the, the effect he goes, and one of the guys said to me, he says, you know, he says, I had a case the other day and I just showed the person the door. He goes, you know, I'm that guy you're talking about that just shows people mm. the door. He goes, and now I feel so bad. You know, when I go back to work, I'm going to call that person back up. You know, and I had a bunch of people come to me, you know, cops that were like hard grizzled type cops that came and said, wow, I, you know, I can't even look at myself in the mirror. I've been doing that to people for a number of years now. And, you know, I, I need to change and I need to really look at this and understand the emotional abuse and the financial decimation that's caused to these people and how it affects their lives. And so by me going there and giving that lecture and speaking is what changes hearts and minds and, you know, gets it to be taken more seriously, but that's the and, only way, you know. And I think they can also hear it from you, you know, because you've walked the beat, so to speak, right. you know, yeah. being a police officer and then a private investigator, you know, that that helps you do the job you're doing now. And it helps you talk to them, talk to cops and, and investigators in a language that they understand. Right. Um, and then putting that compassion piece to it, which is thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I know we have to to wrap up here and I, I, I want to thank uh, once again, uh, Bob, thank you. And, and, and Rob Palmer, uh, you, I, I see you all through my Q and a box here. And I'm very, very grateful because uh -huh. he told me something that I didn't know that if people in the audience, if you, they Google your name, Bob Nygaard and skeptical inquirer presents, you've written, uh, several articles, uh, for the magazine that I think people will find, uh, 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 uh entertaining and, and, and interesting to read. And I've also done opportunity to subscribe to skeptical inquirer. Yeah. I've also. Say? Yeah, I've also done some stuff for AARP, you know, some podcasts and, and stuff. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And, and that's a good organization too, the AARP, because they help and get the word out as well, you know? Yeah, but but this scam is not just age-based. No, everybody. it's not just So if you, you no. think, oh, I'm under 50, I'm good. No, oh, no, 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 you're not. no, no. <laughs> You can be gotten. I mean, one of the biggest subsets of, of uh, victims I have is women between the ages of maybe 25 and 35 who want to get married and the psychic tells them that they're never going to get married and never have any kids. And unless they get rid of this darkness or curse and they get frantic, like, you know, wow, like they're never going to get married or never going to have any kids. I find I have a lot of customers that call me. Um, and then I have a lot of Chinese people, a lot of Indian people, people that uh, there's this superstition in certain communities. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. I find that. I mean, but it does, it goes across all walks of life, you know, and all, and men and women, not just women, men, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's only women that go see the psychics. Nah, it's men too. Wow. Are you listening, fellas? <laughs> it's you too. Listen, I know, I know we've got to let you go. We've got to wrap this up, but can you tell us a little bit about the, the TV show that you're going to be on in well, January? Can you tell us a little bit about the con? Yeah, it's just, it's called the con and it's going to deal with three cases that I had. Uh, involving three different women who were defrauded by self-proclaimed psychics and uh, deal with those particular cases and what those women went through. And uh, the three women are very different. And uh, you'll see how this cuts across all different, uh, you know, uh, ethnicities and, and, uh, and age groups and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. As as, as, as we've talked offline, you know, I'm fascinated uh, mm -hmm. by cons, you know, and, and, and that, so many people across so many lines you know it, it doesn't matter your economics or your culture you can you can fall for stuff because as you said uh the, those three commonalities i wrote them down the love money and health yeah um yeah so i'm um, note to self when i'm weak in one of those areas <laughs> phone <Right>. a friend <laughs> but <laughs> 
But Bob, thank you so much for, for being here. I will remind everyone here with us that um, if you missed anything and you want to watch this, uh, it is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow on Skeptical Inquirer's website, skepticalinquirer.org. And the next talk in this series will be on Thursday, December 3rd, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, Sean B. Carroll will be with us uh, talking about a series of fortunate events, uh, Chance and the Making of the Planet, Life and You. So once again, thank you to you, Bob. Thank you to Skeptical Inquirer and CFI uh, for sponsoring this. Uh, a big thank you to uh, the tech team, Mark, uh, for allowing us to, to, to come to you through the box here. And uh, my name is Leanne Lord. If you want to know anything more about me, um, you can find me at veryfunnylady.com. But this has, been, this has been wonderful and informative and, and touching in spots. So Bob, thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.